Okay. Okay, so this is off the cuff this if time. If we cuss a lot, can we, does that get parts edited too? Beep. No. <laughs> Just try not to swear. Try real hard. Really hard. <laughs> feel like we're on a 90s sitcom. Yeah, basically we are. There we go. Hey guys, thank you. You always get to do the introduction. <laughs> I'm relatively good at it. Okay, go ahead. Right, you got this. Hi guys, and welcome <laughs> back to this week's episode of You Asked, We Answered. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. He's the guy with the pink gun, and we have a couple guests with us today. We have Annie and Charles. They are really good friends of ours. We've known them for a very long time. They have a few dogs from us. They have some of their own breedings that they do. They are also very involved in training dogs and uh, the Knob organization as well. So do you guys want to tell us a little bit more about yourselves or have I taken care of that introduction for you? You did a really good job, Kat. You're a professional. I think you should do it every time. See, Ethan? <laughs> if this is your guys' first time tuning in, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of our great videos. And we also have a podcast of this version. Yeah, he's pointing um, where you can subscribe to. So I thought it was over here. I think it's on no, the No, it's definitely over here. Over there? Okay, yeah. sorry. Oh, the, and ring the bell. Hit the bell for Hit notifications. Bell. That's right. Oh. oh, there's no bell. Ding. <laughs> Thanks for the sound effects. <laughs> so with... <laughs> That's kind of a bell. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. Ish. <laughs> Moving on. I As think... we digress so early <laughs> into this. We are actually going to get started right away. This was a question that was actually emailed in. So people are always asking, how can I submit questions for Yawa? Well, you can do that anyway. You can send an email. You can send a message. You can post a comment when we ask for questions. You can reply to our story posts. Uh, any way that you can get in contact with us is a great way to ask a question for our Yawas. So, question from email from Lee Abbott. I'd love to see a Yawa on what can be expected from the time you submit your application for testing up to and including the time it's your turn to run through a NAVDA test. Example, when do you learn about running orders, etc. And this is a really great opportunity to answer this question because Annie here has done a lot of test secretary through NAVDA as well as she is their chapter's secretary currently. For a different chapter, but yes. For a different chapter? Yep. Okay. Yep. She wears lots of hats. I do. I this do. is her dog training hat actually right yep. now. Right here. See? Ooh, pretty. So, Annie, can yes. you give us a little bit of... <laughs> a little bit of insight into what someone can expect, at least from you and your chapter, because yep. every chapter is different. Um, everybody that is a test secretary <clears throat> is a volunteer, so they're giving up their time, not getting paid a whole lot, zero dollars, $0. to do this. So uh, some people have really great organizational <laughs> skills and are <laughs> almost like obsessive compulsive about getting things organized and keeping in contact with people. Mm. And some people that are volunteers aren't necessarily so. Uh, but if you had entered your test with Nat Annie here, yeah, this is what uh, you can expect. <laughs> so usually um, you'll find the information on navda.org. Yep. Correct? All right. On who the test secretary is. And we'll have an email address. So you'd typically you'd email me my personal email address I would send you a confirmation email back, just letting you know, hey, I got your application. Because sometimes we have people that submit applications six to eight months in advance. Like as soon as we get the test posted, they're sending us the application. And obviously that early on, we don't have very many details on exactly what time we're starting, the running order, all of that. And then if I notice anything on your application that may be blank, I may ask you for that information. So that's kind of another plug when you're filling out the application just to make sure all of your information is filled in. Um, sometimes we do get people who they don't have a number for their dog, and that's perfectly fine because you may have just gotten your puppy and you haven't gotten your number yet. As soon as you get that, you can just email me. So I just try to keep the lines of communication as open as possible. And then as we get closer to the test, um, usually within like a month before the test, I'll send out 
more details on exactly what time we're starting, um, a draft running order. Uh, as a test secretary, things are typically changing anywhere um, up to a week to the day before or day of for the test. So uh, we'll send out a draft running order, well, my chapter will at least, and then you can kind of see where you're at there. So it's just really important. We have to do a lot of work on our end as test secretaries to make sure that you have your NAVDA number is current and active, and then whoever's the owner and handler, and then also your dog has a number. We need to know date of birth to make sure your dog's not aged out before the test, so. And that's only applicable to the natural ability yep, test. natural ability, yep, um, for age. Yep, utility or UPT test, there's no age limit on that test, so um, not necessarily as pertinent about checking dates of birth, yep. but definitely for the natural ability test. Yep, that's super important. So we just try to be as open, and I just encourage people, if you have questions, let us know. But like Kat said, we're all volunteers, so I have a full-time job outside of it. So it may be a day or two before we get back to you. At least or I will get back to weekend. you. Or even the weekend. Some people, you weekend. know, don't get a chance to check in with those emails until the weekend. Um, and usually the test secretaries are also really good about letting people know if there's going to be lunches provided or if there's going to be a no host dinner or a chapter provided dinner for donation um, at the test site. Uh, they can also make recommendations of places to stay. If you need to get a hotel, they typically can get you that information. Um, so if they don't offer that information up, but it's something that you need, ask questions. Um, Everybody wants to be helpful. They just don't always know what people need to know, what they don't know. Uh, typically with natural ability, you're going to run into a lot of first time. First time handlers. Handlers yep. <laughs> that have a lot of questions. And as they progress through the testing program, they're gonna be more comfortable, kind of know the ropes, what's going on, and maybe we'll have fewer questions. Um, but- and, so, and sometimes you just, the test secretaries have done it for so long that they get used to people who have, they just know the ropes. So sometimes they don't think to put certain information in just because it's just something that, you know, everybody in their chapter knows. And so, you know, they may nature. say, they may say, hey, we're going to go over to the B field. And you've never been to that chapter. You have no idea what the B field means. So just feel free, ask questions. Um, there is a field marshal. Yep. That is very helpful the day of the test because the test secretary <laughs> takes care of all the paperwork. But then typically at the test, they're kind of just handling paperwork. Then when you yep. get to the test, there's a field marshal that helps keep the test running smoothly. They make sure that the judges have the things that they need. They make sure that the bird planners are organized and have the birds ready. They make sure that the handlers and owners are headed to the right direction. They are kind of like herding cats um, at some of these tests. Yes, that's an accurate description. <laughs> a lot of times when you first get to the test, the test secretary will probably be the person that you get contact with first. Um, and then from there, they'll say where you're going to go. And then usually there'll be judge introductions. And, and then the judges will generally point to the who's going to be the field marshal and explain, follow this person. Yes. Any questions, ask them. And I think that one thing that people don't understand necessarily about the NAVDA tests um, and the way that the running order works. So let's say you're running a natural ability dog. The maximum number of dogs that can be ran at a test is 10, and you may be the third dog on the list. Well, that doesn't mean you are the third dog that runs through every portion of that test, and then you head home. Uh, the test is actually run in... Uh, field portion, tracking portion, water portion, if you're running natural ability. And that can be subject to change as well, depending on weather and circumstances, field availability. Uh, and it's always up to the judge's discretion of what they want to do, where they want to move forward to. But you will actually follow your running order. So if you're dog three, you're following dog two after every portion of that test. So it's not like you come, you do your part and you take off. You're there all day. And you get to watch other dogs run. You get to interact with a lot of people that have the same passion as you do about training their dog. They put a lot of time into this puppy. Or, you know, if we're talking about utility or UPT, a lot of time into these more finished dogs. And it's a great way to build camaraderie, 
join people that um, are from all over the US sometimes at some of these tests that you might not have had an opportunity to meet and learn about them, as well as you'll get to see lots of different breeds typically too. I mean, if you have a short hair, you might actually get to see a Munsterlander or a Brock Francais or a Brocco Italiano that you're like, whoa, I've never seen this breed before. So it's a really great networking experience as well at these tests. And then, um, like I said, you're gonna follow that dog through the entire test and continue watching and learning from everybody else that's going on. And then at the end of the day, the judges are gonna deliberate, um, depending on what they got to see that day. It can be short deliberation or it can take a little bit longer. And then they'll do kind of a recap of the day and read scores. And that's when you're gonna find out how your dog did throughout each portion of the test. And at that time, if you have questions, that's when you need to approach the judges, ask your questions. Um, they're gonna tell you what they saw that day and explain why they scored your dog the way that they did. And that's one thing that, especially if you're new, I know it can seem a little intimidating, but it's really, really important. Please go talk to the judges. They, they want to hear from you, especially if you had a rough day. You know, if you if you got a 112 prize one, you're probably like, woo, and you just, you know, thanks, judges. And But if something happened, it, you have to learn. And not knowing necessarily maybe you didn't see something or you can miss something because you're caught up in the moment. So I always stress to people, please talk to the judges yes. after the test. Because what happens is, is the next day you go, why in the heck did I get a two? And, and the people that could answer that question were standing there and, and want to answer the question for you. And, you know, the next day isn't the day to try and contact any of those judges because, uh, like we all say, at the end of the day, we put those scorecards away, we mail them into the main office, and I don't remember exactly what happened with every single dog that we saw that day because we see a lot of dogs in a weekend, we see a lot of dogs in an entire hunt testing season, and the um, situations start to blur together. So the time to ask the questions is then in the moment when the judges are all together, they have their scorecards available with copious notes on the back of their cards that they can refer to to answer your questions. The thing not to do is to go on Facebook and post on a forum, why did I get a two? <laughs> My dog obviously did this perfectly because it's perfect. And then everybody go, oh, wow, well, that sounds like you recall it perfectly. Those judges obviously screwed you. It's not the case. Nobody's there to do that. Everybody's there to give your dog the best shot. And it goes in any testing or organization that way. I mean, ask the judges. They saw it. They made a decision based on what they saw that day. And nobody else can, um, except for somebody that was there and saw it firsthand, can tell you what happened. So, yes. The other thing I would suggest if, say, your dog seven of the day is ask a handler beginning in the day if you've never done it before, um, if they would mind you walking with in the field portion if you're curious on what it is. Um, if they give you the okay and the senior judge is okay with it, you can walk with and kind of see what the field portion is like. Um, as a field marshal, uh, I've suggested that a lot of times. And it's usually everyone usually says it's okay to walk with. Obviously, there's isn't 10 people walking with, but it definitely helps with the first time jitters of kind of walking along and you can see kind of what the expectation is. And yeah, you're running your dog in a field for 20 minutes, but it's it makes it a lot easier when you go out in the field and you kind of see what it is. Um, it's not as intimidating as it sounds. It's fairly easy, but I definitely suggest walking with at least one of the first runs and then obviously you just kind of have to watch the tracks ahead of you. You can't really see much usually on those. And water, you can kind of see how it is. But that's also the importance of going to some local chapter training days is they might have mock tests to kind of walk through kind of how your day may go. So definitely participate in those if you can. Yes, and be familiar with the rules and aims book. It's there, it's a resource for a reason. Uh, going to a natural ability test or a UPT test or a utility test and not even having cracked that book, you're gonna be at a huge disadvantage of knowing what to even expect for that day. Um, and if you can read through those rule books, ask questions at your training days so that you can be familiar with what you truly need to know, what you can and cannot get away with, um, going to a handler's clinic, I think they're renaming them Ames and Rules Ames Clinics, and Rules clinics yep. um, would be also great because they are going to explain those rules and what the judges are going to be looking for so that you can be as prepared as possible for test day. Well, I don't know a single chapter, and this may be 
putting my foot in my mouth, but that doesn't have at least one judge that's part of it or something that's around there. And every single one of those chapters also has mock tests or almost all of them. You know, they have some setup or that they can show you. Or training days of some sort. Yeah, that they can go over parts of the Training test days there. that they set up as much to be similar. So you can go, you know, this is what it's going to be like. This is not your test day, but this is what it's going to be like. So, And you can, when you find that information on the, on the website to get your test, sign up for your test, there's also a link there to the chapter website or chapter contact. So whether that's a Facebook page or a web page, and that also can get you information on uh, if they're going to have a mock test, maybe the month before. If Even if it's a little bit of a drive, maybe if it's your first time, it'd be worth driving over and, and checking the chapter out and kind of you'd get to see the grounds and you'd get to go ahead and participate in their mock test. 100%. A, lot of the, a lot of the Midwest chapters do that anyway. And not only go to these tests to observe, but if you become really involved in your chapter, you're going to be able to volunteer. You're going to learn a lot more by watching other dogs work and other handlers work with their dogs. And you'll potentially be able to see, well, I'm prepping my dog for natural ability, but these people over here are prepping for utility. And wow, that's a whole other ball game. And that's something that I would love if my dog could be able to do. And if you have that end goal in sight and have a better idea of where you could be going with your puppy, that you can go, this is a stepping stone. Natural ability is a really great start to judge for natural ability, see what your dog has the potential to be, but then also say, it's just the ground step. You know, it's the it's the door to this whole world of dog training and preparation that you can do to prepare not only your dog for these tests, but also these dogs that are prepared for these tests, which I really feel that the NAVDA testing system is trying to judge and produce dogs that are very realistic hunting dogs, very versatile hunting dogs. So if your dogs can perform at these levels of tests, whether it's a prize one, prize two, prize three, or even if you fall short of that prize, that still means that you have a very well-trained, polished dog that would be a joy to hunt behind. Agreed, 100%. I, I've, I've used all of my utility training in ways that I never think of using it. Um, you know, I never used to heal dogs in and out of, you know, the parking lot or public hunting area. You just let them out of the truck and away we go. Well, when you come up to the, that area and there's three guys with two dogs and you don't know what's going on. Just the simple thing of being able to heal your dog and heal up to your truck and have them loaded up. That's something that I didn't do before I started uh, training towards utility. So, Yes, that level of obedience and control not only um, makes your dog a little bit under control heading to the field, but is just safer all around to have them under that level of obedient control. And along with that, if you are at a natural ability test and you see that they're running utility dogs, either that day with you or maybe somewhere else and you get done early, try to check it out. Um, again, like NA, it, it's a little bit different because there is live fire in the field with UPT and, and utility. So there's some safety requirements and some things that depending on what's going on, you may or may not be able to walk in the field, but um, it, usually you can see part of the test. Um, and, From the and, gallery. Yeah, and so get an idea of what it looks like. I mean, it got me hooked. <laughs> And also volunteer. We love volunteers. Sometimes we're shorter than others, but that's one way to get your foot in the door and kind of see a lot more of the tests and how it goes is get out there and volunteer, whether it's planting birds or, you know, offering to be a field marshal or help handling pheasants for the track. Catching birds. I mean, catching birds. everything, yep. there is a level of volunteerism, even preparing the meals, the lunches, yep. getting the snacks ready for the judges and picking up waters and things like that. This entire organization is all volunteerism. The test secretaries, the field marshals, the bird handlers, the gunners, the judges, they're all volunteers. Nobody gets a paycheck. We're all volunteering our time. So if you can add to that volunteerism, you're definitely going to be able to give back to the organization, and it's going to be very much appreciated. Best view of a test from a volunteer. That's right. <laughs> you right. see the most. On that note, I think we covered a big portion of what it looks like moving through beginning stages and everything else. What do we got for our next question? We're going to actually go through a couple of shotgun questions. We like to call these our lightning round, where we're going to try and get through just a few extra... <laughs> Oops, wrong button. <laughs> Thanks. Nailed I mean, it. Yeah, nailed it. Um, a few extra questions just so that we can answer... <laughs> 
Nope, not the right one either. <laughs> Just keep pushing them. You'll see which button works. You need to get some stickers for those. <laughs> lightning round. Uh, that was better. Okay, enough. I'm asking right. my lightning round questions. <laughs> From Instagram, Annie underscore GSD. I love doing tricks. German and Shepherd? I'm assuming, but I love doing tricks and agility and hunting with my dogs. Would a GSP be a good fit? Uh, the answer is yes, 100%. Have you seen that guy with the crazy yellow and red suit that runs the agility course? Yeah. That's like yeah. a face yeah. video. video. Everybody's seen it. Yep. It's amazing. Uh, I think that you're going to see a lot of athleticism and as willingness far as to work, willingness trainability. To work, trainability, desire to please. Not that other hunting breeds don't have that, but short hairs are probably at the, at the top of the list. We're kind of biased a little bit. Because they're basically the best. Are. <laughs> Yeah. But that bias actually comes from you experience. Know, experience with a lot of different breeds. And not that each breed doesn't have a place. They all have good dogs. There's really good dogs in every single breed. Um, Absolutely. I think that you've got a good shot at that higher energy, desire to work, desire to please, all of those kind of things wrapped up in short hair. Yes. So next quick question from Joey Salazar on Instagram. My puppy has diarrhea. What do you do to help your dogs? Uh, so diarrhea is something that happens with dogs, period. I think it happens with happens. people too. If it's bad, <laughs> go to the vet first. Yes. If there's definitely dogs acting lethargic, lack of appetite, you just act, you know, your dog just explosive diarrhea, can't keep anything in them. Uh, that if you're ever super concerned, that is your go-to to make sure that everything's okay. And uh, for a long period, if it's been, you know, if it's gone a couple of, right. If it's gone over be. three days, there's probably, you're going to have to, you know, three or four days, you're going to have some problems. You're going to get that checked yeah. out. And especially depending on the age of your puppy too, um, dehydration is your number one enemy with di diarrhea because what's going in them is going straight out of them in liquid form. And, um, they're not able to keep any of that liquid and hydration in, and that's going to put them down and under the weather pretty quickly as well. If, um, it's been a short period of time and you know that maybe something potentially happened from just a general stress standpoint, or you went for a long run or Hot whatever. Out. Yeah. Yeah. The there's typically our go-to stressors that we think about. So traveling with our dogs can be stressful. Um, exercising them when it's extra hot out can be stressful as well as changing their diet can be stressful. Even if it's changing their diet in the sense that they got an extra chew bone or treat or something that yep. is extra rich. Those are all things that can stress their bodies out a little bit and they deal with stress by having diarrhea a lot of times. When it's their first birthday and you give them a steak, <laughs> usually results That's, in diarrhea. Yeah, Ooh, so don't do it. Terrible decision. Um, yeah. So those type of things are usually chalked up to stress um, and should be able to be overcome fairly quickly with maybe withholding one meal. Um, the thing is what's going in them is coming right out of them. So maybe we shouldn't put any more slow that GI track down just a little bit. Yeah. Anything else in there that's going to irritate it more in their tummies right now, keep up their fluids, add a probiotic so that their bodies can go, okay, I get a chance to calm down and readjust and then restart their digestive tract the next day with a meal. And if you can make it a blander meal, boiling chicken or just plain hamburger with some rice, just very bland, easily digestible. And adding that into their diet before the kibble and then see how it goes. But again, like Charles said, and I think we've all mentioned, if you're concerned and it's been going on a long time and you've made some changes and you don't notice any new stressors in the environment that could have caused this, there could be something else going on and definitely seek veterinarian help. We are not vets. No. no. Nope, nope, nope. Just dog enthusiasts. That stayed at a Holiday Inn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I think you hit the wrong button again. No, that was definitely the right button. Uh, At least it was the button that I was hey! pushing. There we go. Okay, last question for this episode of Yawa. What is your favorite thing to hunt? Where and why? And I think that we all should get an opportunity to answer this one. Me first? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bob White quail in like the traditional uh, hedgerow, fence row. Definitely my favorite. So Kansas, Nebraska. A little bit of Iowa, but that traditional Kansas bobwhite covey flush gets me real excited every time. 
Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, well, I can only say one because I've only hunted one species, and that would be uh, the pheasant. The pheasant. <laughs> and I think I've only... Rooster, 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 rooster. rooster. I've only hunted in Iowa, but that's just because where we live. So, do you have a like go to? I would love to go on this hunt someday. Charles, damn it, take me with you. Uh, yeah, Argentina <laughs> for doves <laughs> or ducks, and we're nice and hopefully easy. Hopefully, planning that next year. <laughs> so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that is amazing. Yeah, that See? would be really cool. Okay, Ethan, your turn. It's in order. <laughs> I can't just pick one, so I got to go on my first. Canada goose hunt um, that I actually shot a goose. I've been on one other one before in layout blinds, didn't turn out real well, never saw a single goose. So up until that point, it was probably not my favorite, but got to go on one this year and it was guided. So it was really nice. I didn't have to get up early, set out any decoys. <laughs> the blind was already perfect. It was a pit blind, um, heated. So I would Did say- Did they make I, you breakfast in the blind? Actually, they did not because we were done before breakfast. <laughs> so we <Lucky>. actually <laughs> got to go have breakfast. At the I hit the run. wrong button again. <laughs> but um, so that would have been what I said was a really fun, awesome experience. Um, I also have like a dream go to hunt that I want to do. Like, damn it, Ethan, take me along. Um, and this time I'm going to go with him because he got to go out to Montana, Sharp Tail hunting and i think this year we're actually doing a similar trip um but we're going to go to hell's canyon with Ooh. lots of species so chucker. chucker and quail and the laughing huns. little devils <laughs> as you watch them fly yeah. away well, after you climbed four thousand feet yeah <laughs> it's gonna definitely be a test of endurance for us and the dogs but i think it's an experience of a lifetime and i'm really excited for that so the question was, if you could choose one, what, was no. your what is your favorite? But Annie and I have had limited Less experience yes. compared to you guys. So we also have our dream hunt that we threw in there. I, well, I have a dream. We don't, we don't care. care. Right. <laughs> it's scary, huh? Wrong button. <laughs> there. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I'm far as it. a, you know, and this is, this is not a cop out because it's the truth. I mean, if I were to pick one species or whatever, I mean, it's just chasing birds with dogs. It is chasing birds with dogs. Now, if I could pick, it's not a cop out. Cop out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hit the button. It's not a cop out. It I is, agree with you. I do agree I with you. It is chasing. It is chasing the birds with the dogs because I love hunting quail. I love hunting pheasants. I love hunting sharp tail. And um, I would say I can't use the, the four letter L word for uh, rough grouse hunting, but I enjoy doing that. But I it's wouldn't a challenge. As, yeah. And you I don't get to see as quite as love. much dog work typically. Uh, in the and I know like other that. people would di disagree when you see with it, that. Though, so you if you were call. offered a pheasant hunt, a quail hunt, or a rough grouse hunt, or sharp tail. Or sharp tail sharp. hunt. If I had to pick, yeah. If you which have to one pick, of those? What is your would favorite? be your favorite of those four or three? Because rough grouse. hunt somewhere in Nebraska, Kansas, or Iowa, where you can get I didn't quail and I ask pheasants. you. Oh, sorry. You had your turn, Charles. Yeah. Well, I have never <laughs> shot a Hungarian partridge, and that is definitely on my list. So. It's going Still to be not answering an the avoider. question. Avoider. That, I'm going to use I'm the vibrate. That, that is be my until you answer the that's question. That's your dream hunt. Okay. Now, now what's your what favorite? is your favorite? Um, I'm going I'm I'm going to say quail hunting with my buddy Dan in South Texas. That is my favorite. There you oh, go. Perfect. Good job. We Yay. finally it got only him took to two answer minutes. the question. Hit the clapping sound. You don't even know which one it is. Yes. <laughs> Just for the record, she's hit two buttons. They've both been right. You've hit a lot of buttons. They've all been wrong. Stop. <laughs> yes, I've hit all the wrong buttons. All right, guys. Uh, that is all we have for today. Thanks for watching. I am the guy with the pink gun. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. Question mark. I'm Annie. And I'm Charles. Guys, Thank you, we'll guys. Be, we'll be back soon. <laughs> and I'm going to continue to cut Cat off. So tune in for more cat cutoffs. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Wrong button.